All right, everybody. Let's talk about nuclear reactions. Actually, I guess before we do that, let's let's talk about the schedule for the next few weeks, because um, we're almost done. And with grades and graduation happening the last week of classes, um, we're actually going to take our final the week before that, which means a week from tomorrow. Um, so that snuck up real fast, didn't it? When we start backing things up that way. Um, the way that the, the grading deadlines work here means we have to have all the finals graded by the, the end of the week before finals week officially or something like that. I don't know, it's all new to me as well. Um, but that means that we're gonna take our test a week from tomorrow and the there'll be a uh, take home portion of it as well. Um, the take home, I will give you a practice test just like with the midterm so you'll know exactly what you're getting into, um, exactly what to expect from the questions. And that'll be available tomorrow. And then that means our our last two assignments in this class are going to be with a final exam a week from tomorrow. Um, but then the practice test will be a homework assignment like the midterm and the take home final will also be available tomorrow as well. So you'll have your last, the last three deadlines in this class are going to be starting tomorrow. Right. Um, so that's kind of exciting. That also means we better get through some nuclear chemistry, so I can so I can give you some good uh, some good questions about that too. Um, it sounds a little bit scary, but it's actually not. It's just different that we've done so far. It's not actually in that different in terms of the skills when it comes to nuclear chemistry. It's just some vocabulary that's different, and some of the concepts and what causes nuclear reactions change um, or to occur is different than what we're used to thinking about. We're basically going to stop talking about electrons when it comes to nuclear chemistry because nuclear reactions mean that it's all the nucleus that's changing. Anything that's changing in the nucleus is what we define as a nuclear reaction. Um, but first, one last. Uh, my PowerPoint froze the computer. Do this the other way. I change it. Um, I did think of a good um, example of a chemistry reaction that happens in computers. So it's not the computing part per se. Um, I'm talking about this. This question we talked about last week, somebody asked if there's any chemical reactions that happens, happen in computers. Um, it's not the computing part, but it's the battery. Batteries are actually are a classic example of a chemical reaction. It's just a chemical reaction where you have, it's a redox reaction where you have the reduction and the oxidation happening in two different physical locations. And in order for the electrons to move from one spot to another, you make them pass through a a circuit first um and so that's that is not necessarily happening in computers except for the battery parts of laptops and phones and things like that um so it's not the computing itself is not a chemical reaction it's all magnets basically and, and digital storage and even quantum computers is all looking at um is all looking at magnetic states of things but I did think of one application. All right. So let's talk about radioactivity. Um, so radioactivity was first discovered uh, by a French guy named Becquerel. Um, Becquerel was, it, it was almost by accident. They were kind of seeing some of these weird properties of some certain minerals. Um, and they were taking, they were, they knew how to generate 
x-rays already at this point and they were starting to figure out that certain um certain reactions could cause light to appear and and the light wasn't always in the visible spectrum uh, but what really made it clear something was going on was this figure here was actually a was an, an x-ray plate that becquerel had sitting on his desk in his office and he had this sample of of a uranium ore that he just used as a paperweight on his desk and he set it on this x-ray film and it started to develop the x-ray film and he didn't under they didn't weren't expecting that had no idea why or how that was happening but that that chunk of uranium ore was giving off x-rays somehow and so that was the start of research into naturally occurring radioactive reactions um and so he was he was really kind of starting up from his research when um, a Polish woman named Marie Curie um, was, uh, she moved to France because in Poland, once you, in Poland in the late 1800s, you were not allowed to be a graduate student, or sorry, you weren't allowed to go to university. Um, and so she moved to France to go to university. And then even in France, which was fairly progressive for the time, um, if you were a woman, you weren't allowed to be a graduate student and pursue PhD. Um, unless you were married, no, it wasn't, was it, unless you were married, you basically, she basically had to go to Becquerel and convince Becquerel that she was going to be a, a, a credit to the lab and that she was going to be a very good worker. Um, and so Becquerel, um, allowed her to be in his lab and that's where she eventually met her eventual husband, uh, Pierre. Um, you'll notice Pierre is not in this photo of Marie Curie and her daughters, Eve and Irene. Um, and that's because he died very, very early. Um, and it was not anything to do with radioactivity. Although both of their research, they both shared a Nobel Prize in physics for discovering um, radioactivity. Um, he died actually because he got hit by a horse cart in the street. Didn't look both ways before he stepped into the street and got run over by a horse cart in Paris. Um, so Marie Curie, lived to be into into her 60s um, and did eventually die of radiation poisoning but not for many decades after this uh her her daughters are actually both really interesting too it's one of my favorite stories about about science history um her daughter i mix up which one was which i think irene the older one shared marie curie's second nobel prize nope um, her first Nobel Prize is Nobel Prize in Physics for discovering radioactivity and how these processes were happening. Um, her second Nobel Prize was for discovering elements. Um, so the she personally was responsible for discovering, I think, four elements. Polonium is named after Poland. Uh, radon and radium, she discovered both of those elements and I want to say that there was one more that she discovered so that she won her Nobel Prize in chemistry for discovering elements. Uh, she shared that one with Irene. Um, Eve, she did not share a Nobel Prize with, but Eve is equally badass. Um, when uh, the Curies were evacuated from France in 1939, when the Nazis invaded France, um, Irene and Marie left to move to move to the U.S. Um, and Eve chose to stay in France as a, she was a journalist and she chose to stay in France and, and fight as a member of the French resistance. Um, and then was, was kind of pivotal in retaking France um, from the Nazis in World War II. So not a scientist, but also a very interesting story. And then Eve also eventually went on to marry a one of the earliest officials in the UN who was kind of responsible for setting up the U, United Nations. Um, who the, who won his own Nobel Prize, Nobel Peace Prize. Maybe it was an economics prize. I think it was a Nobel Peace, Peace Prize, though. So poor Eve, who fought in the French Resistance, was the only member of her immediate family, including her husband, who didn't win a Nobel Prize, um, which is kind of interesting. I, I find it fascinating anyway. Um, really interesting story about a very interesting family. Um, and so what she actually, her initial discovery 
was that these x-rays only came from certain elements. Um, they came from these certain elements and they they weren't sure why that was happening. Um, but radium, this, this picture is included because radium, one of the elements she discovered, one of the first applications they had for it was actually, radium was actually glow when you refined it and get, got it concentrated enough. Um, and so they would actually paint it onto watch faces so that your watch face would glow in the dark and you could tell what time it was without um, turning on a light. And so that was actually really important in World War II um, for uh, navigators and, and pilots because you couldn't turn on the light in the cockpit of a plane during wartime without giving away your position to the enemy. So if you wanted to know what time it was, you needed a watch that you could read in the dark. Um, and the downside of that, has anybody heard of the, uh, the book Radium Girls? Um, that was actually about the factory workers who painted those watch faces um, because they actually by hand with a brush, a paintbrush, they would paint this radium dye onto these watch faces um, the problem with that was that they, in order to get really fine detail work on it with a paintbrush, they would lick the end of the paintbrush um, to get a nice fine point on the paintbrush. And so they were licking this radium paint. And so there was a whole, there was a whole, you know, generation of factory workers that worked in these watch factories um, that had these horrific radiation poisoning um, injuries a lot of them lost their lower jaws their jaw would had to be amputated um so if you if you get a chance to read that book it's a really fascinating look into um into sort of early early osha reg regulations really looking at off, uh, workplace safety and how but also the science behind it and why these things are really important too Um, let's see. And so Marie Curie was also responsible for renaming. They initially, they just called it radiation. Radiation just meant light. Um, they didn't, that was not truly accurate though, because there was actually another process happening. It wasn't just that these elements gave off light constantly. There was something else happening by which the nuclei of these reactions were changing into different elements um and that was and so she she's responsible for kind of coming through and say well it's not just the radiation radiation is just photons radioactivity um is the process is when you have a nuclear reaction happening when you have the nucleus of the elements actually changing right and so initially the the definition that was used was that radioactivity um, was the release of tiny high energy particles or gamma rays from an atom. And they say gamma rays, but gamma, you know, that's basically high energy light. Gamma rays are just a higher energy than X-rays, um, just like UV is higher energy light than visible spectrum. And so they found these, I think this, does this one have sound effects in the a second? No, basically, um, these tiny particles were basically flying out of the nucleus along with an immense amount of energy in the form of light. Um, and so we'll, let's start, we'll start with some more definitions here. So more broadly than just radioactive, radioactivity and nuclear reactions are sort of synonyms. They're pretty similar, pretty close to the same definition. A nuclear reaction or a radioactivity is just anything that changes the composition of an element's nucleus. This is what's different about this compared to everything we've been talking about. Up to this point, the nucleus remains constant, right? The only thing we've been dealing with that changes is where are the electrons really, right? We've been looking at bonds and charges, but all of that is just moving electrons around. Nuclear reactions are a whole different category. Um, and then broadly fall into two cat two two um, sections, um, fission versus fusion. They're both nuclear reactions. Um, fission naturally occurs on Earth, and that's that's what anytime you have a large enough nucleus, um, there's a there's a finite probability that that large nucleus splits into two smaller nuclei or basically throws pieces of itself off to become more stable. 
once you get above a certain size of nucleus, it's not stable to have a nucleus anymore. And so eventually it breaks down until it gets to that more stable size. Um, fusion is kind of the opposite. Fusion happens when you, if you take two small nuclei and force them together close enough that they become one nucleus. So tip, you're not usually gonna have both of these happening in the same reaction. Usually if you have small elements that are gonna go through a nuclear reaction, it's gonna be fusion. If you have large elements that are gonna go through a nuclear reaction, it's going to be fission. Right, and there's a few main categories of nuclear of um, naturally occurring fission that occur. And they're all kind of interesting in their own way. Um, alpha particles are one of the earliest ones that they knew about. They knew about these actually back before the atomic, um, Dalton's atomic theory, they used alpha particles to kind of, to um, test. Remember that Rutherford gold foil experiment? Sorry, it was not Dalton. It was uh, Rutherford's gold foil experiment. Alpha particles were these tiny high energy particles that naturally came flying out of certain, certain elements. Um, and they had certain properties. They weren't quite sure what the, those particles were. Um, but it turns out they basically are just a helium nucleus. And a helium nucleus, I'll go through all of these so you don't need to worry about that, that list. Um, we'll go back to it in a second. Um, basically, if you have a big enough nucleus that it becomes unstable, one of the main ways that it can break down naturally is by creating an alpha particle, which is also just, you can just think of it as a helium nucleus. And so the way we write these reactions is when we're dealing with nuclear reactions, we always um, write the mass numbers. And a lot of times it can be helpful also to write the, um, in the bottom left, just write the number of protons. It's a little bit redundant because if it's uranium, by definition, it has 90, 92 protons, right? One of the first things we learned about chemistry is that the atomic symbol is tied to the number of protons, right? Um, but for the sake of balancing this out and draw, writing out the product, um, it can be helpful in this case to write that number of uh, protons. Um, and when it creates this alpha particle, we don't usually write it. I'm writing it as a helium nucleus here, just as, an, as a way to show that it's just a helium nucleus. Usually, though, we'll write it as the Greek letter alpha um, to indicate that it's not just a helium atom that came out of nowhere, that it specifically came from a nuclear reaction. Um, so using these Greek letters instead of the helium symbol, instead of writing HE, is just to show that it came from the nucleus. And then the way we balance these reactions out is our mass numbers and our number of protons have to be constant on both sides. Kind of. We'll talk about protons in a minute. But the mass numbers still have to add up to the same total amount of mass before and after. So we had a total mass of 238 before, and we lost an alpha particle. We lost four uh, mass numbers from the uranium nucleus. So now it's 234 instead of 238. And instead of having 92 protons, we lost two protons, so now it's 90 protons. And then we just look at the periodic table and we say, okay, well, what is what is atomic number of 90? If you, it's thorium. So we just write TH for thorium. And so if you know what an alpha particle it is or what an alpha particle is, this is pretty easy to write and balance for the most part. Just make sure that your masses all add up to the same number before and after and make sure that your proton number adds up to the same before and after, same total. We just took a larger nucleus and we broke it into a smaller nucleus. Beta particles are a little bit weird. A beta particle is basically an electron, except it's an electron that comes from the nucleus of an atom. We don't usually find nuclei that have 
electrons, right? Electrons you find around the nucleus in the orbitals. So this is something that's totally new to us. Um, and these, but basically what happens is when you, under certain conditions, if you have the wrong ratio of neutrons to protons in a nucleus, um, they become unstable. Does anybody remember why a nucleus sticks together as a nucleus in the first place? Should, should you be able to stick two protons together to make a nucleus? What do protons do to other protons? They repel them, right? So what is it that holds a nucleus together in the first place? Not, no? It's a good guess. We're, that's all thinking about electromagnetic forces, right? Positives and negatives. There are a total of four fundamental forces, though, in the universe. Gravity. We're dealing with masses that are too small for gravity to really play a role unless we get to like astronomical sizes like, like planets and stars. Electromagnetic is what we deal with mostly in chemistry because that's moving charges around. What are the other two forces? Does anybody know? Strong force and weak force is what they're called, creatively named. Uh, more completely named the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force. Basically, there are these two forces that kind of work in opposition to each other um, that only really work at exceptionally small distances. So basically, when you get atoms kind of close together, the electromagnetic force is most important. But if you get their nuclei really close together, strong force and weak force take over and you get a fusion reaction happening. Right. So but strong force and weak force, they kind of work like I mentioned, in opposition to each other. And they basically are why you have to have a certain ratio of neutrons to protons. The neutrons, you can kind of think of being them, they're kind of like a mediator. Their, their, their job, if you want to call it a job, is, is to keep the protons from pushing each other away too strongly. And so you need the right number of neutrons in a nucleus or it's not a stable nucleus. If you happen to get the wrong number, the wrong ratio of protons to neutrons, like in a carbon-14 atom, say, carbon-14 is not stable. When we're dealing with small elements, we usually want about a one-to-one -one ratio of protons to neutrons in the nucleus for it to be stable. Six to, four, six to eight is not a one-to-one -one ratio, right? If the mass number is 14 with six protons, that's not a one-to-one -one ratio. And so carbon-14 naturally decays, but it doesn't go through alpha particle decay. Instead, what happens is one of those protons changes into a neutron, or sorry, one of those neutrons changes into a proton, which also doesn't seem like it's something we sh that should be allowed, right? Neutrons are neutrons. What do you mean it changes to be a proton? Um, basically, both protons and neutrons are made up of are each made up of three quarks that are sort of bound together. And quarks, there's six different types of quarks, but in terms of normal matter, there's only two that really matter to us. Um, and that's up quarks and down quarks. And we're not gonna spend a ton of time on this because I'm not a theoretical physicist and I don't understand the specific, don't remember the specifics very well. But basically two up quarks and a down quark is a neutron and two down and one up is a proton. And when if you take one of these up quarks and you flip it to being a down quark, you switch from being a proton to a neutron. And when you do that, it's a little bit like an electron that goes from a high energy state to a low energy state and gives off light. We saw that before, right? When we had those electrons falling down from a high energy state to a low energy state, remember those these, this graph here? You have an electron that goes up in energy, that means it absorbs light. When it falls back down, it gives off light, right? The same way that you can create a photon from nothing by moving an electron from a high energy state to a low energy state, you can create an electron from nothing by going from a proton to a neutron. 
or a neutron to a proton. Sorry, I said it backwards. So the, the point, what I'm trying to, what we're trying to show here, the net result is that if you take a neutron or, and turn it to a proton, all of a sudden we still have a mass number of 14. Let me erase the end for a second. But now we have seven protons instead of six protons, which means it's not carbon anymore. So we go to the periodic table and we say, okay, well, what has seven neutral or seven protons is nitrogen. So we convert a carbon 14 into nitrogen 14, which is now it's that one-to-one -one ratio. So it's stable. But in doing so, we still need these numbers to, ba to balance out. And it makes this molecule or this particle that has a negative one charge and no mass. Does that sound familiar? It's an electron. So we write it as a beta particle instead of writing it as an electron. It's not wrong if I actually just wrote it like that. It's not wrong, but we usually, like, like we did up here, we use the, sim the beta symbol to indicate that it came from the nucleus and not from some redox reaction. So, how would I ask a question about this? Well, I could say carbon-14 undergoes beta decay. If you know a beta particle has zero mass, let me rewrite the rewrite this the way that I would work this out. If I say, if I say carbon-14 goes through beta decay, I'm going to say, okay, well, that means it's producing a beta particle over here that has zero mass and minus one charge. And in order for this to be balanced now, I need to make sure that my mass number on what's left over still adds up to a mass of 14. And now I have to make sure that this negative one adds up to whatever number I put for protons to add up to six. So what do you have to add to a negative one to make it add up to six? Seven. So you can think of it as, there's a lot of ways you can kind of conceptually look at it. You don't have to think about it in terms of quarks. This is what's actually happening. But you can think of it as like as a neutron lost an electron and now it's got a positive charge. That kind of is a little bit like the way we think about ions, right? If something loses an electron, it's got a positive charge now. So if a neutron lost an electron, now all of a sudden it's a proton. Which is all, it's all weird though. It's kind of different rules than what we've been dealing with. Right. Let's just wait till we get to the next one. So the next one is positron decay. A positron decay is a lot like beta decay, so much so we still use the beta symbol. The thing is, a positron is like an electron with a positive charge. It has the same mass as an electron but it has a positive charge instead of a negative charge. Basically a positron is antimatter. Antimatter is literally just regular matter, except with all the charges reversed. Antimatter, a proton, the equivalent of a proton called an antiproton has the mass of a proton, but with a negative one charge. And a positron has the mass of an electron, but with a, I say positron, the uh, anti-electron, yeah, I did. Uh, an antiproton has the mass of a proton, but with a negative one charge. And a positron has the mass of an electron with a positive one charge. Basically, same rules. Everything behaves the same way, just with all the charges flipped. Um, and, that mean, and that's what you get when you turn a neutron into, sorry, when you turn a proton into a neutron. So it's basically the exact opposite of beta decay. You can, you could have anti-water and you can have, um, they were able to make anti-protons anti at Berkeley and they used the magnetic containment field um, to, I think they existed for almost a second. They were able to make a measurable amount of anti-protons. The problem when an, is that when antimatter bumps into regular matter, they 
it explodes basically they both disappear and cancel each other out and all of that mass is turned into energy um but the in theory we actually there could be entire galaxies of antimatter we can't actually tell the difference though because we they would have all the same energy levels anti-hydrogen has the same orbital energies as regular hydrogen so if all we can do is shine light on it or observe the light that's shining on on us it looks identical it's not until you actually can measure the charges that we could tell the difference yes oh, just explode might be the wrong word we would disappear and be converted purely into energy into light energy it turns out it's not conservation of mass it's conservation of mass and energy we can thank Einstein for this one in his most famous equation. This is, we actually get to talk about E equals MC squared today or on Wednesday, depending on if we get to it today. But yeah, if, if the mass just disappears, where does it go? What does that violate conservation of mass? Well, yes, because it's not, it's really conservation of mass and energy. All of that mass is simultaneously converted into energy following Einstein's equation. The, and really, in, the, in terms of chemistry, usually we write it like this. Change in mass for a reaction is equal to the change in energy. So if you have a difference in mass before and after, you just do final minus initial for the mass times the speed of light squared, and you get the amount of energy associated with that, energy, with that reaction. Um, and we'll actually do some of those calculations and look at, at this. Turns out the mass, um, the mass has to be in kilograms, but if you do this and you, you wind up with it in kilojoules per mole, like we were doing, um, like water has a pretty high um, vaporization, enthalpy of vaporization, right? Um, and it has, it's delta H of vaporization is something like, something like 150 kilojoules per mole. Nuclear reactions like these ones, have a, have a change in energy that's in the like 10 to the 10 to the 10 kilojoules per mole. Like burning ethanol, burning glucose is really exothermic. It's like, you know, 1600 kilojoules per mole. Burning gasoline is about 1600 kilojoules per mole too. So we're talking about a million times, a factor of 10 to the six times bigger energy for a nuclear reaction per mole than burning fossil fuels it's a whole different ball game when we start involving the strong force and the weak force all right we'll look at so we'll run those numbers and look at some some context for them as well um for now though if i say that phosphorus 15 undergoes positron emission so I write it right. Phosphorus uh, 30 looks like this. If it gives off a positron, it basically lost a positive charge from its nucleus. But the mass number didn't change. So if we lost the positive charge from the nucleus, what's the new positive charge on the nucleus? 14, but the mass didn't change. So it's still a mass of 30. So then, and then we just look at our periodic table. Okay, 14 is silicon. All right, so all of these reactions, they still balance. They just balance with a different set of rules. They balance not by counting, I need to have the same number of phosphorus atoms before and after. They balance because you have to have the same number of mass units before and after and the same number of protons, kind of. You have to have the same number of charge units before and after. 
they'll still add to the same net charge before and after. And then the, the last major type of naturally occurring decay is called electron capture, which is basically the opposite of beta emission. So a beta particle emission, an electron flies out of the nucleus. In electron capture, the nucleus basically snags a passing electron from its, from its 1s electrons, basically. If you wind up capturing an electron that has the same net results as a positron emission though. So ruthenium 92 is an example. If you just took ruthenium 92 and you threw an electron at the nucleus hard enough that it stuck, is basically what a particle accelerator does, is it just accelerates these things to really, really high speeds and then slams them into each other. If you take ruthenium 92, and you throw an electron at it, mass number is zero with a minus one charge, we still need to balance out these charges, right? So 44 and a minus one is gonna add up to 43. And our masses didn't change. So this is actually the first way that they were able to, to generate technetium, the, the first discovered synthetic element, they basically, they used a particle accelerator and, and used ruthenium and they just threw an electron at it hard enough that it stuck into the nucleus and it made technetium. Problem is, is that technetium has no stable isotopes. And so it basically immediately starts breaking down and the, the uh, rate of breakdown for technetium, the half-life is only a I think it's like 90,000 years. Um, so this is a process that would have naturally occurred during the supernova that, that came before our solar system. But all of the technetium was gone before we knew to look for it. Because if our solar system is, you know, is 4.5 billion years old and the technetium that was naturally occurring in it was made 4.5 billion years ago, there's none of it left anymore. So it's a synthetic element, not because it can't happen in nature, but because it doesn't naturally occur on Earth at the time frame that we're looking for it, which is a little bit different than saying it's, it's totally synthetic. The only samples we've been able to find are synthetic just because it was all gone before we knew to look for it. All right, let me go back to this list. So our four primary types of naturally occurring fission. Alpha particles look like a helium nucleus. A beta particle is just an electron that flies out of the nucleus. Positron is a beta particle with a positive charge. And then electron capture is exactly what it sounds like. An electron, a right, nucleus grabs an electron and pulls it in and that changes the overall charge on the nucleus. The last one is, is on there mainly is because of historical reasons, because technically all of these first four produce gamma rays. The exact wavelength of light that gets produced from these reactions is based on E equals MC squared. If you know what the mass is before and after, you can, you can plug in the change in mass times the speed of light squared and get energy. It's basically like an exothermic reaction, except exothermic reactions give off heat, right? This is still an exothermic reaction, except it's trying to give off so much energy so quickly that it can't just lose it as heat. It has to generate an electron, just like an electron falling from a high energy to a low energy level, it generates so much energy that you wind up um, creating photons, just like an electronic process, just like an electron transfer. Um, and the exact wavelength of those photons is going to be based on E equals MC squared. 
So all of these reactions produce gamma rays of different wavelengths. Some of them even in the visible region like radium. Most of them are so, so high energy um, that we can't observe them with the naked eye. They're well outside the visible spectrum. So instead of having visible light going on, um, being given off for most of these processes, we just wind up with X-rays and gamma rays and even higher energy forms of light being created. So it still gets, it's not, gamma rays are not a type of vision. They're like, they're a byproduct of vision. But historically, they didn't know that. They just knew that some particles gave off alpha, or some uh, materials gave off alpha particles and some they couldn't observe these positrons. All they could see was the gamma radiation coming off. So they just said that gamma rays were a type of vision, but that's not actually accurate. Right, and so, and gamma rays also include X-rays. Sometimes you'll see them written as a product. Um, that's kind of an old school way of doing things. Now that we understand where this light is actually coming from, we don't really treat it as a product so much as we would just, we would um, write the energy change for the reaction using E equals MC squared. All right, so this is, um, a pretty decent um, just summary slide. I, the only thing I don't like about it is that it puts gamma radiation in the middle. Uh, and it's pretty common in textbooks that you have, have gamma radiation listed as, as a type of radiation or of, uh, radioactive uh, processes. It's not technically a radioactive reaction though. The gamma radiation is just produced um, as a byproduct. Oh, this is the one that has fun sound effects. Um, just as a, we'll talk, if we have time, we'll talk about health effects of radiation. Um, but just as a, a way of thinking about these different types of particles, our, our main types of particles that, that come out are alpha particles, beta particles, including positrons, really. Positrons are kind of their own thing, but they're pretty similar. They get put in the same category because they're the same mass and same general amount of energy. And then the gamma, the gamma rays that come off. Um, alpha particles, they're so big, they're really high energy and they, they can be really damaging to tissue, but because they're so big, they're, act, they're also moving a little bit slower and they kind of get absorbed by things a lot easier. A little tiny piece of a piece of lead that is 0 0.01 millimeters. So, sorry, let's see, 0 0.01 millimeters, 10 micrometers thick. So basically a piece of foil so thin that you can almost see through it is enough to stop alpha particles. Beta particles, though, being smaller will pass through that just like the Rutherford gold foil experiment. Um, gamma radiation though, it's just light. And so because it's just light, it'll pass through pretty much anything until it finds something that has the right electronic transitions that it could actually absorb it. Basically lead is transparent to gamma radiation until you have something that's, um, you know, a meter thick or so. So with that in mind, why do they have us wear that little lead vest when you go to the dentist's office and gets your x-rays taken? It doesn't really do a whole lot. It limits it a little bit, but it's not really all that helpful. It's mainly because um, when x-rays were first discovered and x-rays were first turned into um, a piece of medical equipment, um, nuclear was still a very, very scary word to most people and radio radiation is thought of as being really, like you can think about radiation still has really negative connotations associated with, right? It's just light. Why does radiation have such a negative connotation to it? 
uh, it's because they didn't really understand it. And so they basically gave you a little safety blanket um, to to help you with that. You, you know, the nurses don't wear that, right? Nurses leave the room, go into a shielded room because they're doing this 20 times a day, right? If they were being exposed to that many radiation scans, that would be a big problem for them health-wise. You getting a dental, a dental x-ray once every six months, not a big deal. Um, the odds that it's causing any sort of issues for you is negligible. They still give you the best so that they can say they're limiting it, the exposure as much as they can, but it's really not making that big a difference. You're still exposing your whole head to radiation, right? So um, was there a question? Well, is it, is, are they going behind the left wall? It's pretty well shielded. Um, there and and really the physical space and just the more matter you have between the radiation source and Especially the person, the right? Yeah, it's well. All of these go they dissipate as one over r squared, right? Because as you're increasing um, distance from the point, the sort you think like the surface area of the sphere that's impacted is increasing by the radius squared. Um, so here's an example of how I could write, I could ask a question about this on the test. I'm not going to expect you to know that different elements or, you know, memorize carbon 14 goes through um, beta particle decay. I'll tell you that. And then have you write out the products, right? So something like this, potassium 40 is used in geological dating. We have time, we'll talk about how that all works. Um, and it can either go through, it can either emit a beta particle or it can go through electron capture. Let's try to write the reaction for both of those processes, two separate processes. So write two reactions, potassium 40 emitting a beta particle. So start by just writing out potassium 40 and your beta particle. So potassium is 19, right? Yeah. If it emits a beta particle, really what I'm testing is, do you know the vocab? And then do you know how to balance this reaction? Right, so you have to know that a beta particle has zero mass and has a minus one charge. So then to balance this, the, of the remaining nucleus is still gonna have a mass of what? still going to be a mass of 40. And now we need to, we need our charges to balance out. So if we had 19 protons over here and then there's a beta particle it has to be a 20 here. 20 plus negative 1 gives us 19. Right now it matches up. One of the 21 neutrons lost a negative charge and is now a proton. So 20 is calcium. So answering that question, if I tell you it's beta decay, you just have to know what a beta particle is and then make sure that your numbers balance out. If it goes through an electron capture, still starting from potassium 40, Electron capture means we're still going to write our beta particle out the same way. It's just a reactant now, not a product. So what do we make? Argon. 19 plus negative 1 gives us 18, which is argon, with a mass number of still 40. The mass numbers aren't going to really change um, other than alpha particles. And alpha particles are almost easier to wrap your head around because it's literally, you're literally just breaking a part of the nucleus off. All right, questions so far? Weird, but it's once you know the vocab and, and a little bit about what's going on, it kind of makes sense. Alpha particles are big enough to think of them as particles and not waves, right? Correct. So when they break off, they behave kind of like projectiles and bullets. Exactly. And the electrons do 
two, but electrons are in that weird in between where they have quantum properties, but they also still have mass. They're not a photon. Um, so it's a little bit different with the beta particles, but that does kind of partially explain this, right? The alpha particles get stopped pretty quickly unless you have a really, really thin alpha particle and alpha emitters are really most dangerous if you accidentally ingest them. Because if you if you um, are stopping your alpha particles really, really quickly with your stomach lining, say, that could still cause a lot of damage. It's something like basically the alpha particle can't make it through your shirt because it gets stopped so quickly. But if you have a direct exposure to your skin or if you eat it and you have a direct exposure to your intestinal tract, that causes lots of health, health effects. Beta particles are pretty dangerous no matter what. Does anybody grow up with um, CRT TVs? Or have I reached the point where nobody grew up with CRT TVs anymore? The big boxy ones? And yeah, did you ever get told not to sit too close to those? Why? I don't just because because you're in the way it's bad for your eyes is what I was told because basically what what those CRTs are is they're basically firing high energy electrons and using magnets to make sure those electrons hit the right spots in the TV film which then causes it causes the film on the inside of the screen to glow for a second and so those actually were really bad for your eyes to sit too close to because not all of the electrons actually hit the phosphors and actually lit up the TV. You actually did get low levels of electrons beamed directly into your eyeballs if you were sitting too closely to those. Um, anymore, that's not true. So anybody tells you that sitting too close to the TV is going to damage your eyes now is really just asking you to move. Um, are there any ingredients in like cigarettes that are alpha? Beta? No, those are mostly carcinogens because, um, so I don't know specifically about nicotine, but burning things in general creates lots of free radicals, which cause mutations in the body too. Um, and that's actually why mostly why radiation radioactivity is bad for you is because it actually will hit the water molecules in your body and turn them into oxygen radicals. And the oxygen radicals can cause mutations in your genetic code. Um, so it's the same end result as smoking things, but in general, smoking things is really, really bad for you because you're basic, when you heat something up to that point, you're generating tons and tons of free radicals and you're just inhaling them into pretty delicate tissues um, that are pretty susceptible to mutations. Also the same reason why you actually shouldn't eat burnt food. Burnt food also has lots of free radicals for the exact same reason that smoking is bad for you. Um, your stomach handles it a little bit better than your lungs do, but it's still bad for you. For, if they're black, the rule of thumb is black is bad, brown is good. Brown food tastes good. Black food is actually carcinogenic. Small amounts, though, it's okay. It's all about managing risk, right? Every day, right. Um, does anybody know what the number one carcinogen in the world is? Oxygen. I've, have I mentioned that before? Um, that's a good. That's a good guess, Cash. Uh, oh, okay, Quinn. Um, yeah, because when your body breaks down oxygen to make CO two, it actually creates oxygen radicals. A small number of those molecules get released as oxygen radicals in your cells. Um, and your body has a pretty decent system that goes around, they call them free radical scavenging um, enzymes that are, can basically capture those free radicals and, and neutralize them, um, but they're not perfect. So the number one carcinogen in the world is breathing. Um, and since you can't avoid that, you're never going to avoid all carcinogens. So I say that just as an example. So like, you really like burnt marshmallows once in a while? that's not probably not going to be the risk factor that tips you over the top, right? It's going to be oxygen. There is a tipping point though. Going out and smoking six packs of cigarettes a day definitely makes nicotine and smoking a much bigger risk factor for you than breathing oxygen at that point. Um, does anybody know what the, want to guess what the vitamins are that support 
the uh, free radical scavenging enzymes. It's a marketing term seen in uh, health. Antioxidants. Antioxidants are just the vitamins that those free radical scavenging enzymes use. They, there's certain molecules your body can't synthesize. And so eating foods with lots of antioxidants does actually slow down that process and lower your risk of getting cancer from free radicals because you're supporting that, that system that already exists in your body. Coffee has some, um, most of all those things, if you've ever heard of the term superfoods, there is actually some science behind a lot of those. Most, most uh, blue and purple fruits tend to have lots, the anthocyanins that are actually in those that give them the purple color are antioxidants. Um, so blueberries, acai, pomegranates, that kind of thing actually does have a fair bit of antioxidants to it too. Um, I'm trying to think of what else is there on the superfood list. Um, kale, actually, spinach, dark leafy greens support that system as well pretty well. All stuff that's gonna that's pretty good for you. All right. Mm, do we want to get into this? Well, we're covering more material today. It's just a question of whether we talk about why some things are stable and or not. Or if we get into the math. Um, let's talk about this a little bit because it is a term that shows up. And then we'll talk, we'll do the math for these and we'll talk about them, um, that on Wednesday. So I mentioned before that those strong force and weak force work best. There's a certain sort of sweet spot where you have the right number of neutrons to protons where those strong force is works best and it has, you have the most stable nucleus. Uh, and they call that ratio of protons and neutrons that are stable. They call it the valley of stability. Um, basically, all of the green dots here are stable radioisotopes. They're stable in the sense that um, they might go through a nuclear reaction, but they're not doing it on a time scale that we could even measure. Um, so they're stable enough that you could say that they don't go through nuclear reactions naturally. Um, all the yellow ones are radioisotopes that are stable enough that we can make them or that we see them made in nature to some extent, but they still go through radioactive processes. So like carbon-14, for example. Carbon-14 is naturally occurring, but it's also not stable. So carbon-14 would be a yellow dot. Carbon-12 is a green dot. Carbon-12 is stable enough that it doesn't change. It stays as carbon-12. Basically, on, in, we're talking about over billions of years, it still stays as carbon-12, unless something else happens to it. Um, but if you get too far away from that ratio, that valley of stability, you wind up making things that are either so unstable they can't exist for longer than a few microseconds, um, or even shorter, or we can't even get them to, to be observed. There are some isotopes that are so unstable that we can theorize that they exist. Like we can make up an, an isotope of whatever we want with whatever ratio we want, but if it's too unstable, we'll never be able to actually make it or observe it in a lab because it'll just fall apart too quickly. You can think about it a little bit like, you can think about the protons and neutrons a little bit like water and sand when you're building a sandcastle. You gotta have the right ratio of water to sand or else you can't get your sandcastle to stick together, right? The sand's too dry, it just falls apart. If the sand's too wet, it just falls apart. If you get that right ratio, then it'll stick together pretty well. But there's a little bit of wiggle room. You can make a sandcastle that's pretty stable, but not that stable, right? If you mess with the ratio too much. So that ratio gives us value of stability here. Um, and the other thing that people often ask, it, I usually get questions somewhere in the quizzes about why are we bothering to make these really unstable nuclei? We're using these, building these billion dollar particle accelerators. Why would we bother doing that, making things that just break down? Well, 
us understanding strong force and the weak force means we can actually predict there are certain ratios that should be more that are more stable than we would otherwise expect. Um, they call those magic numbers. If you have magic numbers. I don't like that term. Physicists are weird, though. Um, physicists refer to the magic numbers as the right ratio of protons to neutrons that should allow for a stable nucleus. Um, and there's actually some predicted um, pretty stable elements that are all the way out here past 120. So if you look through here, all of these are, so these are a number of neutrons. Um, we synthesize everything up to 120 or 118 uh, protons. So nucleon is a proton or a neutron, basically a particle that you find in the nucleus. Um, but it, knowing that these magic numbers exist means we can actually predict that about atomic number 122 to 125 should be a pretty stable nucleus. Um, and with that in mind, that means that if we could actually make some of those even heavier elements that'd be in row eight of the periodic table, some of them should actually be pretty stable. It might have some really, really interesting properties when it comes to engineering things or, or just further science study. Um, so we're pretty sure it's a little bit like, I guess to use the, the island uh, analogy, we're trying to sail into an area we don't know what's there, but we're pretty sure there should be something there. Uh, and we'll see what happens with that. Maybe it's possible that humans will never actually make any of those theory theorized super heavy stable elements um but might as well try that's how you do science right all right the last term i want to talk about uh, last couple terms that we'll talk about here um and we've already kind of defined these but we're going to put some numbers to it now or some um, official terms, vocab, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, it turns out with a lot of these nuclear processes, if you look at the mass before and the mass after, they don't actually add up to the same number. So to go back to the original question about, well, what about the law of conservation of mass? It's really the law of conservation of mass and energy, right? according to E equals MC squared. So the mass defect is actually the difference between the mass of the pieces and the mass of the nucleus. So if we look at fluorine 19 as an example, fluorine 19, really stable, made up of nine protons and 10 neutrons. What's the total, the total mass of that? What's the mass of a single proton? One, but if we added more sig figs, we actually have a number for it beyond that. I mean, you just look at hydrogen for the most part. It's about 1.008. That's the mass of a proton. And 1.007 is the mass of a neutron. So the total mass of fluorine should be something greater than 19, right? Because both of these numbers are close to one, but they're both a little bit above one and we have 19 of them, right? So the total mass of fluorine should be nine times 1.008 plus 10 times 1.007. That'd be 0.072, so something like 19.1 ish, 1.14. When you plug that in, right? What's the mass of fluorine 19? Fluorine 19 is the only stable isotope. The mass of fluorine 19 is 18.998. Why aren't they the same number? Because that extra mass 
is converted into the energy that's holding the nucleus together. The difference in mass between these two is a difference of, if we just subtract that 0 0.1 142 ish. That difference between the, the mass of the components and the total mass is called the mass defect. And that was really confusing back before E equals MC squared was well known, right? There's a reason this is a really famous equation it's because it was totally unexpected. Why should the difference between these be so big? It turns out all of that energy, all of that mass is turned into the binding energy, the energy that holds that nucleus together. And we can actually do, do the math here to see how much energy that is. We put this in grams per mole. If we want to know the amount of energy there, we have to do this in physics units. This is a physics equation, so we have to use physics units. What's the physics unit for mass? Kilograms. So we have to put this in kilograms per mole. So it'd be 1.42 times 10 to the minus four kilograms. And then C is the speed of light. Does anybody know the speed of light offhand? It's on your conversion sheet, but it's about three times 10 to the eight meters per second. We're going to square that. When you get, when you square this, you get meters squared over second squared. And a kilogram times a meter squared over second squared has a physics unit associated with it. Scott? Yeah, Jules. If you take, if you just look at the units, kilograms, meters squared over a second squared, that's the definition of a joule. So remember the joules, again, this is from physics, so, so it's not entirely relevant, but kinetic energy in physics is equal to one half times a mass times a velocity squared. So if we plug in all of our standard physics units, kilograms, meters, and seconds, we get meter kilograms times meters squared over seconds squared. What do we get for an answer here? I haven't made you do any math today, so nobody has their calculators out. Well, this is squared, this would be nine times 10 to the 16, right? Times 1.4, it's gonna be something like 1.3 times 10 to the 16 minus four times 10 to the 13. I think, again, it's not all that important. M main thing is that all we did was we took our mass defect, the difference in mass between what we, the pieces are and um, our measured actual mass that you have to look up. You can't get this number from anything. I use fluorine as an example because it's one of the few elements that only has one isotope on the periodic table. So I can use the periodic table to, to uh, remember that mass. And that's a really big number also, right? Even when we put it in kilojoules, that's still going to be 10 to the 10 kilojoules. And 10 to the nine is a billion. So we're in the 13 billion kilojoules per mole range here. Really, really big numbers. Considering our really exothermic reaction is like 1600 kilojoules per mole. And we're now at 13 billion kilojoules per mole. Um, other fun application here. 
is we can actually look at if you look at the periodic table or the mass of the different isotopes. Um, for the most part, they're just under a whole number, right? Because of that mass binding energy, but just how far away they are from the actual mass, uh, or the uh, just how big that mass defect is, the term is depends on what element we're talking about. Basically, really small elements and really big elements don't have very much binding energy, which is another way of saying they're not as stable. More binding energy actually means more stable. More of the mass has been converted into the energy holding it together. Um, so there actually is like a sweet spot where you've maximized the nuclear binding energy. Um, and it's between iron and is basically centered around iron. Um, iron and through the rest of that fourth row of the periodic table are the most stable elements. And then after that, it starts dropping off pretty quickly. Not that quickly, but if you notice, uh, there's a point on the periodic table. You can't see it on this one because this one doesn't have, um, does it? It does have some of them. Basically, everything above bismuth, everything above an atomic number of 83 is radioactive. There are no stable isotopes for anything that's above a mass of 83, or sorry, above an um, atomic number of 83. Everything bigger than that will go through fission and break down to become smaller pieces. And then, Logan? Yeah, so um, I heard that diffusion reactions like in the sun the heaviest element that can be created is iron is that a coincidence or is that no that's related? that's directly related to this if you try to put iron through more fusion reactions it actually takes more energy than it gives out and so that's when you have the star at the end of its life cycle collapsing in on itself the fusion process can't sustain itself once you get the iron and so depending on the size of the star, a lot of different things can happen. Some stars slowly expand because there's not enough force keeping them together anymore. Some stars go through a supernova. Some stars collapse entirely. Um, that's all based on the size of the star. But they all stop at iron for this reason. Logan? Oh, there's a dip in the chart. Wow. Dip in the chart. That's a weirdness, isn't it? That's one of those magic numbers that physicists like to talk about. Um, helium is pretty stable, lithium less so. So lithium actually will go through fusion reactions easier than helium-4. But helium-3 has really low binding energy. So helium-3 actually is even more reactive than lithium. It's just less common on Earth. Um, but yeah, there's and there's another one too that's right by the carbon one. This is kind of an, an ex you can look at the math and look through the strong force and weak force and figure out what those are. But that's a little bit beyond what we're going to do in this class. Tosh? Um, sloppy graph making. They, they let the graphic designer be in charge of making the graph instead of the, the scientists. Um, no, they're just really showing that's like that's the maximum that it's right around iron. And also, this is this is one of those pieces of evidence that prove that our solar system is a second generation solar system. If this was a first generation solar system, meaning that it, that our sun and our solar system was formed just from the components from the Big Bang, um, we shouldn't have anything larger than iron naturally present in our solar system. Really, it would be mostly just hydrogen and helium with a little bit of lithium. Um, the fact that we have elements higher than iron naturally present in our solar system is only possible because another solar system, another sun went supernova and caused a bunch of these really, really heavy elements to form. And now these really, really heavy elements are slowly breaking down over time. When I say slowly, I mean really slowly. We're talking billions of years. Um, but that's why stuff like uranium is naturally occurring on Earth because of the supernova that came before us. So if you've ever seen that phrase, um, is it, we are all stardust, is basically the end of a long monologue that, that a motivational speaker was using talking about um, 
about the solar system that came before us and the fact that all of us are the result of a supernova that had happened previously. All of the atoms on Earth were once part of another star, which is kind of cool to think about. And on that note, we'll end today's lecture.